All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mob Museum. My name is Shakela Alvarenga. Thank you for our audience in person and those online for watching. It is a pleasure to introduce our Tom O'Connell to the podium. O'Connell was the former senior litigation counsel and chief of the narcotics and violent crime section at the United States Attorney's Office in Las Vegas from 1993 to 1997. Now, in addition to his 13 years in the Las Vegas U.S. Attorney's Office, he also served for eight years in the Northern District of California, prosecuting primarily violent crime and gang cases, including spearheading Operation Garlic Press, a joint state-federal sting, which resulted in 118 arrests, one of the biggest takedowns in California's history. And during his tenure in Las Vegas, he tried many high-profile cases, including the kidnapping of Kevin Wynn, the daughter of Steve Wynn. There will be a Q&A portion after our program, and just a reminder, our bar downstairs, the speakeasy, is actually staying open, so if you want to grab a drink afterwards, you can. Please welcome Tom O'Connell. Okay, thank you. Um. Las Vegas, the 90s, the new Vegas. The actual birthday was November 22nd, 1989, the day the grandiose, lavish, sparkling new Mirage was unveiled to the world. The strip had been reinvented with an exploding volcano, a dolphin show, white tigers, and sharks looming in a huge fish tank right behind the reception desk. The architect of all of it was the young, toothsome, and always tanned Steve Wynn. The naysayers said Wynn would never be able to generate the $1 million each day that would be required to keep the lights on. They were wrong. By 1993, the year of the infamous kidnapping, the Excalibur, the Luxor, the MGM Grand, and Wynn's own Treasure Island would be built. Thanks to Wynn, Vegas was booming but his world was about to come crashing down around him. Some of you may recognize that voice. That's uh, Glenn Meek. It's the introduction to my podcast, Vegas Fed. Glenn was a reporter here for many years. He also was an investigator for the Federal Public Defender's Office, and he's now an author. With that, I'll get right into the crime. On July 6, 26, 1993, uh, Kevin Wynn, 26-year-old daughter of Steve Wynn, worked at the Mirage. That evening, she had dinner in a hotel with her parents, her sister, and a friend. At the time, Kevin lived in a condo in Spanish trails at the corner of Rainbow and Tropicana. Next slide, please. Here's a map for those of you cartographers or just fans of maps. You can see Spanish trails and uh, the golf course and whatnot. My wife loves maps. Uh, next slide, please. All right, this is a photograph um, of that intersection. You can see on the left the sign for Spanish Trails, and it's kind of difficult to see, but below that large sign off to your right is a rectangular brown sign that says Carl's Jr. Uh, that's going to become relevant uh, in a few minutes. As Kevin Wynn entered her home through the garage that evening, she was met, met with the shock of her young wife. Well, I walked over towards the answering machine and I had several bags with me, so I was going to put them down and I was facing my cupboards and I heard something, so I turned around. And as I turned around, two men came running at me from my living room area. These are actual audio tapes uh, from the trial that you'll be hearing tonight. The men's faces were concealed with stocking masks. They gr grabbed her from behind. Uh, they spun her around so that they could, she could not get a clear look at them. She could tell that one of them was taller, heavier, and had a dark complexion. The other was shorter, uh, fair-skinned, and uh, fit. And he seemed to be the man in charge. Right, next slide, please. 
I was very scared. I, I, was, I was shaking. I said, what, what's happening? What's going on? What, what are you doing? I said, and, the, and the shorter man kept saying, calm down, calm down. And it took them a while. I was shaking. And they were just, he was trying to calm me down because I was, I was trying to, you know, break away. And um, I said, what do you want? And the shorter man said to me, we want money. I said, okay, what money? And he said, we just want the casino's money. And at that point, I, was, I, I thought my life was over. I thought that was it because they knew who I was. And this wasn't just a random thing that I walked in on. This was something serious. And they knew who I was. And they, were, they had a plan. They told Kevin to contact her father. After dinner, he had also left the Mirage, and they couldn't reach him there. So she suggested that they contact him on his car phone, uh, and she did that. And I said, Dad, it's Kevin. I've been kidnapped. And I could tell my father was just about to say, what kind of joke is this? And I said, I repeated myself. I said, Dad, I've been kidnapped. At the trial of this case, Steve Wynn described that first call. A man's voice came on the phone. What did he say? He said, listen carefully. We've got your daughter. Go to the hotel. Go directly to the cage, to the casino cage. Stand in front of the cage so that you'll be easily visible. And wait for a phone call. So Steve Wynn returned to the Mirage and approached the cashier cage per the man's instructions. At the trial, he would describe how he felt at that moment. I remember that my, uh, my kneecap was shaking and I couldn't make it stop and my breathing was short. And all I could think of was Kevin. This would be the first of several phone calls Wynn would receive during the night uh, from the kidnapper's leader the shorter guy, as Kevin described him. Um, when the phone rang again, it was the man. He instructed uh, Wynn to put all the cage money in a bag. First, he wanted small bills. And then there was a tense exchange between Wynn and he in which uh, Wynn had to educate him that uh, this wasn't a bank. Um, he was worried about marked bills and expl exploding die packs. And Wynn told him, once again, this is a casino, not a bank. I don't even know how much small bills we have. They went back and forth, and Wynn decided he would pay them in hundreds. He ordered his casino cage manager to collect all the hundreds and put them in a bag. As this was going on, uh, there was a lurid photo session occurring in Kevin Wynn's home. I know that the first thing you and your father are going to do is try to come and find me. So I need insurance. You know what insurance is? I said, yeah, I, said, I think I understand. He says, well, you are my insurance. And, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to have you, we're going to take some pictures of you. And he said, and we're going to have you take off your clothes. And you're going to take these pictures with one of us. And we're going to cover your eyes with sunglasses so that it looks like you were cooperating in these pictures. And I started to shake because I thought, I'm going to have to take off my clothes and I'm going to be raped. And that's what I thought the next thing was. So I got very scared, and I, I, I started saying, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. And he said at that point that um, it would all be over with if I just cooperate. Now, uh, beyond uh, what you just heard, the uh, kidnapper, the main culprit, the shorter, fair-skinned man, told her, that if she or her father contacted the authorities, uh, these photographs would be mailed to the National Enquirer. And he went on to remind Kevin of the Amy Fisher story, 
which if you don't recall that, uh, it occurred on Long Island. And Amy Fisher was a young girl who shot the wife of her boyfriend in the face, her boyfriend being one Joey Buttafuoco, who incidentally lived one block from my parents in Massapequa, New York. But it was a nice neighborhood. Uh, we kept this whole thing sealed for a year in the hope that we would plead the case that Kevin uh, and Steve would not have to testify that this humiliating photo session would never be publicly revealed. And uh, after negotiations failed, um, we proceeded to trial, and we had no choice but to disclose this. And this part of the crime uh, particularly sickened and enraged me. And that plan? was a perverse and sick photography session in which Kevin Wynn was forced to disrobe down to her underpants and to pose with Jake Sherwood while Mr. Cuddy played the record. Steve Wynn had been ordered to have his chauffeur, Albert, deliver the money to the parking lot of nearby Sunny Saloon. Uh, Sonny's was located about a half a mile from the garage on what is now Sammy Davis. Um, if you look at the photo of Sonny's in the foreground, to the left, extreme left, you'll see a 7-Eleven, um, which will become relevant. Albert was then to go to the nearby 7-Eleven that you can see and play slots to kill time and wait for the pay phones outside of the 7-Eleven to ring. Now, the next photograph will show you just how close the 7-Eleven and Sonny's were to the Mirage. That's the 7-Eleven on the end of that strip mall. And there's the Mirage before the Beatles were up, up on top. Cuddy left Kevin's house in his own car and picked up Anthony Watkins at the Carl's Jr. He returned to the 7-Eleven Sonny's area to wait for his delivery of cash. He put Watkins in a cab and sent him off to the Karen Airport. Back at the Mirage, Steve Wynn was playing it very cool he ordered an armed security guard who resembled Albert to play along as if he were him. With nothing more than those orders, the guard, a guy named Charles Price, was not rattled a bit. He confidently told his boss, I can handle it. And he played the role of Albert, delivering the money to the Sonny's parking lot. Meanwhile, Sherwood was transporting Kevin Wynn, her arms bound behind her back despite her protests and buried under a pile of blankets in the back of her Audi to the location where she'd be left, McCarran Airport. Like her father, she kept her cool. She made an effort to pay attention to how long they'd been driving, listening for any familiar sounds, and even engaging Sherwood in conversation in the hopes that she'd have the ability to ID him by voice someday. After going up the circular ramps of the parking garage in McCarran, Kevin knew where she was. Up they went, but quickly went back down. There were no spots. The car stopped, and Kevin heard someone say, no charge. It was the parking attendant who collected the ticket from Sherwood. Sherwood then proceeded to the oversized parking area, which is where Kevin would be left. In time, what seemed an eternity, Wynn and a few of his closest advisors, who'd been summoned to the Mirage, got the call. They raced to the airport, long-term parking area. Kevin was shaken but safe when they found her in a car at around midnight. The following day, a command post was established at FBI headquarters, the old FBI headquarters on Charleston. 
It was a scene worthy of the movies. With nothing to go on, a huge conference room was filled with agents and cops, including the FBI SAC and Metro bosses, all crammed at a table. We were being briefed every few minutes with any potential nugget of information that might prove helpful in identifying the perpetrators. The coordination of this thing was remarkable. We had guys running in and out of the room every few minutes, bringing back tidbits of any aspect of Wynn's life that might help the case, and adding it to the long whiteboard. We didn't know it yet, but the case had actually already been solved. We were just waiting for corroboration of a hunch by a vet veteran agent, a former Buffalo cop named George Lyford. I remember George telling me, I just tried to think like a kidnapper. He figured if he was going to try to snatch somebody out of Spanish trails, he'd want to look out nearby. And he knew the area. He knew that the closest public phone, this is in an age pretty much before cell phones, with a few exceptions. He knew that there was a payphone on the corner of Rainbow and Trop at a Carl's Jr. restaurant. So life had pulled the tolls from the 7-Eleven, that is the telephone tolls, the record of, of calls. He also pulled the tolls from the Carl's Jr. and he compared them. Bingo, the same number in Sacramento, California, had been called from both locations. There were also common calls between the phones and a cell phone. And again, in 1993, the U.S. Attorney's Office had one cell phone, which I had during this investigation with me. It was about the size of a World War II walkie-talkie. Uh, the one uh, that showed up in the tolls had recently been purchased by a guy named Ray Cuddy. Then an agent showed up at the command post with Picaran Airport records. They reflected that a car registered to a Ray Cuddy was in the oversized parking area at the same time Kevin was there, trapped in her own car. So Ray Cuddy was ID'd. The Sacramento number came back to Mary and Glenda McBride. Two sisters were pretty rough around the edges. The McBrides were interviewed the following day and predictably lied. So we subpoenaed them to the grand jury for their next session. And they lied again. So we indicted them for perjury. Sacramento FBI agents, led by Chuck Riley, a real hard charger, were thrilled to put the cost of them later that very same day. And I actually got to watch that on the Las Vegas news, the Sacramento agents putting the McBrides in their cars in cuffs. Uh, subsequently, a dozen of their mostly unemployed, directionless, 20-something friends will be tracked down by Sacramento agents led by Chuck Riley. And what do you know? Can you guess who their new boyfriends were? A couple of gang-banging cousins named Jake Sherwood and Anthony Watkins, who had recently been in Las Vegas. Now we had all three ID'd. Next slide. Oh, you got it. Thank you. The loser friends would also tell all about the $100 bills flying, courtesy of Sherwood and Watkins. We'd corroborate all their purchases by subpoenaing business records. Now the search was on for all three defendants who had been identified in just a matter of days, thanks to George Lyford. Las Vegas agents quickly located Cuddy's son living in a shabby apartment he shared with his father. He seemed to be candid with the FBI, and he said he knew of two black kids that his father had flown to Vegas recently. He also said his father was on his way to Newport Beach after making some kind of big score that night. Before he left, he gave the kid $500 bills. So now the search was on a Newport Beach. 
Now, in any investigation and prosecution, um, as is when, with any business matter or, for that matter, personal matter, chemistry is important, and there are often disagreements. Um, and in this case, this was the opportunity for my first disagreement with several FBI agents. I wanted them to locate Cuddy and surveil him. They wanted to locate Cuddy and arrest him immediately. Uh, I suggested that by surveilling him, he might lead them to the ransom money, $1.45 million. Of course, Sherwood Watkins had some, but we didn't know the breakdown at that time. I remember one of them said to me, well, what if, he, what if he splits from Mexico? And I said, well, you're the FBI. Don't let him. Anyway, the SAC called the SAC, by the way, that's special agent in charge, in LA to make sure it would be smooth with him to have Vegas agents coming and working in, in his area. And it was decided between the two of them amicably that it was fine. Uh, there's always the fear of another agency or even another uh, office in your own agency stealing a case that's high profile. Uh, and that was, that was worked out too, that that wouldn't happen. So the SAC, uh, in agreeing with me, agreed that once we found Cuddy, he was going to be followed. Now, Cuddy was a Newport Beach, California wannabe. He loved living among the rich and famous. The problem was he wasn't one of them. He was the part owner of a gym, but he had had a falling out with his partners. He sued and won a $500,000 lawsuit against him, only to see it reversed. This was apparently his motive for the kidnapping. Before the kidnapping, after his time in in uh, Newport Beach, he was living in Sacramento, pumping gas with Sherwood, a young gangbanger from Gary, Indiana. Then he moved to Las Vegas in desperate straits to live with and work for an old friend named Jimmy Kazaya, who owned American Printing on Fremont Street. At some point during that period, he came up with the idea, a way out of his relative poverty, and that would be the kidnapping of Kevin Wynn for ransom. Now, Cuddy had worked at the sports house in Las Vegas years earlier before he transferred to their facility in Newport Beach. Now that he was back in Vegas, his buddy, Kazire, uh, fronted the money for him to become a member. So he was hanging out at the sporting house. Uh, I believe it was on industrial quite a bit. Kevin Wynn happened to be a member there. And we surmise that this may have planted the seed in his head, uh, running into her, seeing her there. So he now had Sherwood recruited. And Sherwood brought his cousin, Anthony Watkins, in as well. Cuddy was running around, we now know, with about a million dollars in hundreds. He was spending his money lavishly and offensively. I'll give you two examples. He purchased a pair of ostrich skin cowboy boots for $2,000. And he bought a $15,000 Rolex for himself. Uh, the take had been a bit more than the $300,000 he told Sherwood it would be. Sherwood, in turn, lied to Watkins about his share. So there's no trust among kidnappers, apparently, or honor among thieves, as they say. Next slide, please. Cuddy's ultimate prize upon returning to Newport Beach, where he thought he rightfully belonged, was going to be a $200,000 car, a Ferrari Testarossa. The purchase of which he promptly began to fund ineptly laundering money in Newport Beach. Now, he did this in a number of ways. If you listen to the podcast, there are more specifics. But he had no idea what he was doing. 
And uh, fortunately for him, although not ultimately, uh, none of the businesses in Newport Beach that were required to fill out various IRS forms when conducting cash transactions bothered to report it to the IRS. And I was beginning to wonder if Newport Beach might be the money laundering capital of the world. So, Sherwin Watkins was spending hundreds, Cuddy was spending hundreds, and as my co-counsel argued at trial, they left a paper trail that would choke a goat. Uh, he's here in the front row, his name is Jay Angelo, but forgive him if he doesn't come up and speak, he's just very, very shy for an ex-Marine. Now by now, Sherwin Watkins were feeling the heat in Sacramento, they took off for St. Louis with the help of a friend and or relative, we're not sure, named Fred Ford III. It would be September by the time the St. Louis agents located them. Once again, their associates were interviewed. These associates, however, were completely unlike the motley crew of misfits in Sacramento. They were a bunch of middle-class suburban teenage girls who they'd met at the mall. Once again, hundreds in kidnapping proceeds flew. We dragged the naive, naive teenage idiots to Vegas for grand jury appearances, accompanied by their less than delighted parents. Once again, we followed up on items purchased via the generosity of Sherwood and Watkins with subpoenas for business records. Between Sacramento and St. Louis, we proved up around $70,000 in spending on cars, I'm sorry, cars, jewelry, a motorcycle, and just playing cash awards to their pals, which demolished the false statements they made to St. Louis agents when they were apprehended, claiming they'd been in Vegas, but it was only to do a drug deal. They were each gonna sell a kilo of Coke for $20,000. So even if they got the Coke for free somewhere, it did not and could not explain $70,000 in a, at a spending spree. It's actually made me think about the movie Goodfellas from 1990, when Jimmy Burke, played by Robert De Niro, starts whacking all of his cohorts for disobeying his orders not to go on spending sprees with the proceeds of the Lufthansa heist. I guess Cuddy didn't see that movie. Another Hollywood reference uh, to this matter uh, was made in the uh, 2000 updated Ocean's Eleven. The Andy Garcia character, Terry Benedict, who was pretty obviously based on Steve Wynn, tells George Clooney after he's gotten away with his heist, if, you'd be pick if you should be picked up buying a $100,000 sports car in Newport Beach, I'm gonna be extremely disappointed. Kind of a challenge. Well, we probably got a provable case at this point, but we, and especially Jay and I, wanted to keep digging. An additional agent was put on the case, Skip Wilkes, a young West Point graduate. Also, Sean Healy, an IRS Criminal Investigation Division agent and a money laundering expert. So they joined Mike Growney, who was a 20-year 20 20 FBI veteran and himself an attorney, and Jay, who I just referenced, an experienced AUSA, a former Marine Vietnam vet, and a Navy JAG officer, and myself. Quite a formidable team, if I may say so. Next, a headshot piece of evidence came back from the FBI lab. It was a fingerprint match to Sherwood on a ticket from the parking garage at McCarran which had been returned to him by the attendant who'd said no charge when he couldn't find a spot and had to resort to the oversized parking lot. Ultimately, the third conspirator, Anthony Watkins, the lookout at Carl's Jr., decided to cut his losses and cooperate. He'd give jurors the story from the inside of the plot to kidnap Blondie, as Cuddy disparagingly referred to Kevin Wynn. The case was just getting stronger and stronger. 
There comes a point uh, in many cases where the agents who have to do the legwork feel the prosecutor is being unreasonable and enough evidence has been secured to sustain a conviction. And that pretty much happened in this case. So there was a little bit of friction on a couple of matters. One was jail calls. Now, this is back in 1993, but I had heard somewhere along the line from a colleague or at a conference that uh, the calls, collect calls made by prisoners at the uh, detention center in LA uh, were recorded. So I asked the FBI agents to figure out how you get a hold of them and get them for me. Well, I was told, no, no, that's a waste of time. Cuddy would never be stupid enough to say anything on the phone. Now, I disagreed, knowing that people in jail are extremely bored. They use the phone constantly, have fights over phone privileges, and it's their only contact with the outside world. So I called the detention center, was told what had to be done. I needed 100 bucks. The boss, Catherine Landreth, authorized it, and I got the calls. Ultimately, on a bunch of cassettes, which I listened to at home, on my own time, and my office's dime. And I remember it was a Friday evening, and I was listening to one of the cassettes on my now old-fashioned stereo system. And sure enough, Cuddy asked his son, what is Wynn saying? We didn't hurt her or anything. What is he saying about the whole thing? He was parenthetically terrified of Wynn and wanted to plead in LA, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't permit that. We had done uh, all the work, um, and he had offended this community, and we wanted him back here for his trial. So the phone calls bore exceptional fruit. Uh, another thing with agents, federal agencies, is they're kind of competitive, and uh, the FBI doesn't like bringing other agencies into a case. Well, I don't think I mentioned this, but Jake Sherwood had a gun pointed at Kevin when he and Cuddy entered her home. And a gun was recovered later uh, from Cuddy. It was a 357 Magnum, and I wanted it run down. Uh, so I enlisted Terry Clark, an ATF agent, uh, which was my practice to bring in any agencies that could assist in the, uh, the priority, the mission, which was the case, not credit or egos. And Terry was able to find a man who personally sold the gun to Cuddy, ended up testifying and pointing to him. He also got all the paperwork and said, yeah, there's the guy, there's Ray. I sold him that 357 that you found in the trunk of his car when he was arrested. Now, uh, Cuddy filed several spurious motions, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, we had a hearing, and it was held on St. Patrick's Day, 1994. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny, the two Irishmen were going to have a little Donnybrook on St. Pat's Day. And Cuddy testified, and I got to cross-examine him. And, uh, it didn't go well for him. In fact, his false testimony that day would earn him an enhancement to his ultimate sentence for lying under oath and thereby obstructing justice. <laughs> Trial commenced on May 3rd, 1994. We basically steamrolled over the defendants with a mountain of evidence. Cuddy's defense was a ludicrous one, a legal defense, that the sum of $1.45 million was insufficient to affect commerce, which is an element of the federal extortion statute we'd used. There was no actual kidnapping charge because she wasn't transported out of state. The charges were extortion by kidnapping under the federal statutes. 
Sherwood's strategy was to lay his part off on one of Cuddy's friends from Newport Beach, Spiro Campbell, in whose garage Cuddy had stashed 500,000 in hundreds. Ignoring the fingerprint evidence on the parking ticket, his attorney would claim Sherwood was not the driver of Kevin Wynn's car that night. It was Campbell. Then things got really interesting. Again, you can listen to the podcast for the details, but I can take a wet my whistle. It's actually water, by the way. The report of interview called an, a, a, uh, an FUA 302 of that parking booth operator uh, was interesting. She was a Cambodian immigrant who spoke somewhat bro broken English. And the night of the kidnapping, according to this report of interview, she said that the driver, she remembered him, was white. The problem was when we interviewed her in trial prep, we, we learned that that was not what she told the agent. She told us that what she told the agent was that the driver looked dark, like an Italian. Now, an Italian, to me, does not mean an African-American, but to this Cambodian immigrant, she didn't see things in black and white particularly. She said, no, no, I never said the guy was white. He was a dark, dark guy, like an Italian. Well, we almost fell out of our seats when we asked her if she'd seen the defendants on TV. And she said, yeah. And we asked her, well, which one was the driver? And she said, the, the big black guy, Sherwood. <laughs> and this was like almost unbelievable. We had naturally turned that report over and the defense was gonna base uh, th their whole presentation on that. Um, and I'm supposing they never interviewed her but they called her as their witness. And you know, the, the rest is, is history, pretty obvious. That didn't go well. So the jury was out for parts of three days. Jay and I were, of course, concerned, but you know, on the other hand, we told ourselves we presented a massive amount of evidence for them to sift through, and maybe they were just doing their due diligence. It turned out we didn't have much to worry about. Next slide, please. We the jury in the Robert Cuddle case of honor of to say that we find the defendant, Ray Marion Cuddy, guilty of defense charged in count one of the indictments. Verdict. We the jury in the Robert Cuddle case of honor of to say that we find the defendant, Jacob Carroll Sherwood, they were actually convicted of all the counts charged in the indictment, which included use of a firearm and a crime of violence, money laundering, uh, et cetera, aiding and abetting. Our next slide, please. We promised to seek harsh sentences if the defendants put the Wynn family, and especially Kevin, through a trial. We made generous plea offers of 12 years, which were rejected. And so we filed motions for upward departure from the federal guidelines based upon the heinous nature of the crime and particularly the unduly cruel photo session, as well as the targeting of such a vulnerable victim, Steve Wynn's own daughter. We were extremely fortunate in this case that had been assigned to Judge Lloyd D. George. As many of you may know, the federal courthouse is named for him. Um, next slide. Uh, very sadly, we lost Judge George last October. He was first class, a fine judge and a fine human being. He was a Las Vegas original and a legal icon who could have written several books about his youth here, his education, his career, and his family. And he is missed. Judge George was more receptive, more than receptive, to our emotions. He sentenced the defendants to 19 years, Sherwood, 
and 24 and a half years, Cuddy, respectively. I would characterize what you did as brutalizing Miss Wynn, her family, and indirectly your own family. Conduct was not only opportunistic, uh, but it was, in my judgment, base and vile. That's what he had to say for Mr. Sherwood. Uh, a few weeks later, Cuddy was sentenced. Next. Doing the demeanor and the uh, conduct of Mr. Cuddy, I see absolutely no uh, evidence of uh, remorse or regret except for what it uh, may bring. There's absolutely no excuse for these acts. Well, so down came the hammer. In return for his cooperation, Anthony Watkins, the lookout, uh, who testified at trial, was sentenced to seven years. Glenda McBride, who also testified to six months in prison, six months in a halfway house. Her sister Mary, six months in a halfway house, six months of home confinement. They each got a very stern lecture from Judge George, who underscored how lenient they were being treated and how harshly they could have been treated. Incidentally, all the witnesses who I'd harangued for months before Jay came onto the case pretty much hated me. So they became his witnesses at trial. Not my problem. <laughs> Later, the defendant, the last defendant, final defendant, Fred Ford III, kind of a mystery man, he pled guilty. He got two and a half years for assisting Sherwood Watkins' flight to St. Louis and spending chunks of their ill-gotten gains in the process, including purchasing a, a car for that purpose. Naturally, appeals followed, and ultimately the convictions were affirmed. There was a bit of drama up at the Ninth Circuit. You can listen to the podcast if you're interested in that. Uh, in closing, I have to say that both Kevin and Steve Wynn were no less than heroic throughout their ordeal, and they really were. Also, this case demonstrated how valuable federal resources can be. We had Metro and the Las Vegas FBI work in this thing. We also had Sacramento, LA, and St. Louis agents all over it. And we were using nationwide subpoena power extensively. These are things the DA's office simply could not have done. <clears throat> so, there's a lot more. The podcast is six half-hour segments, so that's three hours. Um, and it was tough getting it down to three hours. But I'd like to thank Jeff for the invitation and Shakela for her assistance and patience with me. I am not a techie. I'm not even close. And... Uh, she helped me put that, helped me. She basically put together the, this PowerPoint. <laughs> so uh, I guess there's a Q&A. Uh, and if, if uh, I just have one final note, and that's, this is just a personal thing, to remember uh, our own Las Vegas Metro officer, Shea Michelonis, who was uh, critically wounded over the summer uh, during a demonstration. Uh, he spent his 30th birthday at rehab, and by all accounts, although his family's very private, it looks like he may be paralyzed for his entire life. So, you know, say a prayer for Shay, if, if you would. Okay, that's all I have. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Should I sit down? A round of applause for Tom oh. O'Connell. No, you, thank you. You should you stay right there. We've got a few. I'll stay. We, we have an opportunity for anyone to ask a question. Um, we have uh, the microphone here. I have, uh, I'll start with one question so far that we've received from an online viewer. By the way, uh, more than 100 people online uh, watching the program tonight. So very exciting about that. Um, a, a man named Jason Moore, Tom, is listening, and he wondered, was there any physical evidence recovered from the apartment? Where, where the kidnapping occurred? Kevin Wynn's condo. Uh -huh. uh, there were uh, f uh, footwear impressions uh, 
And they wore gloves, had masks. Interestingly, the, uh, the uh, crime scene investigator mentioned that Kevin Wynn's house was the most pristine she had ever examined. Uh, and yet, uh, not very much physical evidence at the house, no. Um, I, I think um, worth mentioning how, I, I think you touched on this, but maybe not in detail. Um, uh, when, when her car was recovered, it was recovered by uh, Steve and his uh, aide, right? And how, what was the situation there? What was the scene? Well, she was uh, uh, in the back seat, uh, tied again behind her back, which she pleaded for them to tie her in front, and they refused. And uh, she had been told that if she didn't cooperate, they were going to put her in the trunk. This is July in Las Vegas. She was also told she was going to be watched by someone in a van. Um, so the scene was when, and uh, I think a guy named Jim Powers, who was the FBI SAC, and Bobby Baldwin, uh, who was the president, I believe, at the time of what, the Golden Nugget or something, accompanied him. And Steve ran up to the car himself, which I think was a pretty gutsy thing to do. And I remember him saying, while well, he testified, I was going to find what, what was to be found. It was going to be me. And Kevin, again, was, was okay, very shaken, of course, but physically unharmed. Excellent. Okay, here's another question. Well, anybody who has a question in the audience here, please come on up and we'll, uh, uh, we'll do that. But there's another question online. Uh, a man named Ralph Conti asks, um, how much money was returned or recovered, if any? We uh, recovered approximately, the number was something like $900,000 between the 500000 in Spiro Kemble's garage uh, and monies that Cuddy had on him um, in his hotel room in Newport Beach where he stayed those few days before his arrest uh, and in his, his vehicle. So I think we, we accounted for something like $900,000. And m money, there's money that was spent, of course, on multiple cars, jewelry, uh, et cetera, et cetera, just given away that was not recovered. It was gone. What about the car that Cuddy had? Did that go back? It was a, how did that, what happened to that car? The Ferrari? Yeah. <laughs> well, as I said, they were surveilling him and they knew all about the Ferrari. In fact, FBI agents were working out in the hotel gym, like within feet of him. And uh, no, when he showed up to make his final $60,000 payment on the Ferrari at Newport Imports, they were waiting for him and locked him up. So he never got his hands on the Ferrari. You know, a lot, a lot of people had attributed this, kind of like the reference from the Ocean's Eleven, had sort of uh, mocked, to some degree, law enforcement that, well, how hard was it to catch this guy? I mean, there he is spending $200,000 in cash on a car. Well, like I said, nobody in Newport Beach, no banks, no jewelers, no car dealers, reported any of these cash transactions to the IRS. Uh, moreover, we were already on him. So <laughs> they watched him go to the place and put money down and on the Ferrari. It wasn't the Ferrari that did him in. It was the investigation. Now, we know from your, from your presentation that these weren't the, the brightest criminals of all time, but um, with, I have a question from Gary. Uh, uh, he's asking about if, if, like, today's technology, would this have made it easier for you to track these guys, or, or would it not make any difference? Well, if they use burner phones uh, instead of public pay phones, uh, lifers' hunch wouldn't have panned out. You know, on the other hand, uh, had they used cell phones that were, could be triangulated and tracked, it, it just depends on the circumstances of how they would have played the thing out with modern technology. Right. We have lots of questions coming in from online, so that's good. Uh, um, this is a good question to wrap things up. I think you know where this is going. Are, are any of the defendants still in prison? I think a lot of them have gotten out or moved on. Uh, they're all out. And, uh, you know, in the federal system, uh, best case scenario, you do at least 80% of your time. And 
that was kind of newsworthy or made the news, getting back to Glenn Meek, Cuddy was released from Vegas, just because this is where he'd been sentenced a couple of years ago. And Glenn was doggedly pursuing him and did a little news newscast uh, of uh, him kind of chasing Cuddy, who's on his motorcycle, trying to get away from him. But, uh, no, they were all out. Uh, Cuddy might still be on supervised release. I don't do the math on that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's been a long time. And they're you out. know, it, it, I'm always curious about this. Now, Cuddy, I, I don't, did he have any kind of record before this? Well, he, uh, I believe there were some juvenile offenses, which, you know, were sealed. And there were some allegations, which I go into on the podcast, uh, that he had committed a rape, and they were very, very compelling accusations. And uh, it's kind of disappointing that the local authorities in Newport Beach did indict him for that at the time. But there were, comp there were some complications. Okay, all right. Um, this is a question uh, uh, from Barry Lindemann. He says, has anyone ever thought of making a movie out of this story? Yeah, I have, you know. <laughs> I just need about 10, 20 million dollars from somebody and right. I'll get right on that. <laughs> so as far as, nobody has been approached necessarily about uh, right, making no. by a producer? No. Okay. Now, hopefully I'll hear from George Clooney after this. <laughs> right. Um, the last question I have uh, from online is, uh, how hard is it getting witnesses to talk in a case like this? Well, look, the hammer is, 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 is the strength of the evidence and the sentence they're looking at. I had gotten to the point where I had charged perjury in, in several cases, and I would bring news people, newspaper clippings to debrief, if the attorney allowed me to debrief the client. I'd say, look, this is what happens, okay? Of, of perjury cases. You, you're going to go in there and lie, and I'm telling you right now, ultimately you're going to testify for us, but you're going to go to jail. If you go in there and tell the truth, we're done. But a lot of them couldn't be convinced. Yeah. Any, any questions from the, uh, from the room? Okay. I have one last question, Tom, yeah. then I'll let you go. So I'm just curious, did you and your team, uh, uh, the, you know, the federal agents and others, did you guys hear from Steve Wynn after the case? <laughs> well, we did, we got a letter from Elaine Wynn, okay. uh, each, each member, and uh, very, very gracious, and she was a very gracious lady throughout all of this, very nice. Um, then Mike Brownie retired, the FBI case agent. And they came to uh, his going away party, as did Jay and I. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. I'll give you this one. As you know, Jeff, I have a lot of stories. <laughs> but uh, Elaine, when I'm with my wife, says, oh, look, Steve, there's, there's our prosecutor. And they come over, oh, hi, hug me. So we're chit-chatting, and my wife's talking to Kevin and her sister. And Mrs. Wynn says, you know, Tom, you may be interested in knowing that uh, I'm going to spend the weekend uh, up in uh, Lake Tahoe with, with Bob Shapiro. Now, this was like right after the OJ case. <laughs> so I go, you know, Mrs. Wynn, no offense, but I'm not a big Shapiro fan. Well, my wife later is like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with your big mouth? I don't know, I just, I just had to say it. <laughs> uh, you're also uh, occasionally in touch with Kevin Wynn, is that right? I was not in touch with Kevin for decades until very recently when I wanted to let her know what was going on with this thing. I felt obligated to do it. And she was fine with it. And um, I felt obligated to give her notice is what I meant. She was fine with it and she's doing well. She sounds like she's, she handled it well then and sounds like she's handling it well now. Hasn't forgotten it, but I, I think she's fine. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Tom, thank and you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.